Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeves, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome to our lovely guest today, Deborah Mullings. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Deborah is a wife, a mother of three adult sons and a former primary school teacher. She is a Christian, committed to issues of social justice, including fair trade and bringing an end to modern day slavery and human trafficking. Following a three month sabbatical with her husband in Palestine, Deborah has been actively involved in raising awareness of the injustices and human rights issues in that land. This has inspired, propelled and absorbed her in her textile work and given a focus for most of what she creates. Deborah primarily loves hand stitching, reveling in the very tactile qualities of the work. So there we are. And Deborah has a new website and you can find her on deborahmullins.uk. So that's correct, isn't it, Deborah? It is. Right. Excellent. So there we are. And is that the best place to get in touch with you via your website? Yes, or on Facebook. Um, the, the main picture on my first page on the website is the is the uh, the image that I use as my profile on Facebook. So it's usually quite easy to find. Me. Quite easy to find. That's it's like red and green, isn't it? That's right. Yes. OK, super. So, Deborah, before we get started with your stitchery story, would you like to share with us what you are working on and what has got you excited? Right. What I'm working on at the moment is um, section six of eight um, of a piece that's going to be mounted in an umbrella, Ooh. hence the, the number of, of sections. Yes. Um, when I was in Palestine, we visited uh, a, a renovated Arab bath in the centre of Jerusalem called the Hammam al And I lay on the floor and took pictures. <laughs> the domed roofs have yes. lots of little holes in lovely patterns. And the pictures, the photographs showed all sorts of wonderful colours of terracottas and turquoises and rusts that I didn't see with the naked eye, uh, with the light coming coming through them. And so I've been, this is the second piece that that I'm working on based on these these photographs. So I'm cutting little little holes and and in deep black, very matte fabric um, that then I insert terracottas, rusts, turquoise is blues um to, to to represent the the light coming through the these holes so um it's quite a project and yes. i'm not quite sure how it's all going to work <laughs> i have taken an umbrella apart yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that that's that's filling much of my time at the moment yes yeah, so i'm not surprised well that does sound really exciting and um, using an umbrella to represent one of those domes is a, an absolutely marvelous idea as well so a good one for coming up with that and it, it's funny isn't it how Quite often we're we're looking at something and then we take a photograph and the camera saw something else that we didn't notice and it's it's wonderful how things come out or the colours come out differently and so on, doesn't it? So that's always a good good source of inspiration anyway, isn't it, taking photos? Yes, I, I use photographs mm. a lot because I'm not really a very good drawer. Yes. Um, I, 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 if I really put put my mind to it, I can I can draw. But it's I, I like working from photographs, and I say often it's it's colour and just elements of shape that that I take take from the photographs rather than trying to represent something incredibly lifelike. Yeah. Well, that, yes, that's it. And. I don't know about you, but I go around taking pictures of fairly random things as well. And if anybody's with you, they're saying, what on earth are you taking a picture of that for? What are you doing? Oh, well, it's just the shape or the shadow or that funny little twirly bit or that bit of old paint or whatever. And they just look at you as if you're insane, don't they? Yes, I recently took a photo out of my, out of my window of um, an upturned wheelbarrow, the compost um, bin and and an old rusted dustbin that had been used as an incinerator because the light was on it and the colours were just fantastic. So yes. watch this space. <laughs> Brilliant. That's going to be your next lot of inspiration, some old junk in the bottom of the garden. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so kind of moving on from that, uh, the excitement of the upturned umbrellas, how did you first get interested in embroidery and textile art, Deborah? And, you know, who taught you and, and what did you do? 
I think like so many people, I had a mother who uh, knitted and sewed. She she made all our clothes, mm. really. Um, she she, 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 she dressmate. I, I joke that I was born with a pair of knitting needles in my hand. And that's <laughs> probably why she needed a cesarean section. <laughs> um, but it does mean that, you know, I've, I've, I've done that really from, from, from very young. Um, and I started making quilts when I was a teenager. My domestic science teacher would be amazed mm. because I was a not very cooperative pupil and um, most of the things she wanted me to do I didn't want to do and I insisted I can't remember what she wanted me to do but I said no I'm going to make a patchwork cushion <sighs> and I had my mother's large rag bag of interesting textiles she'd lived in Jamaica ah, right. for a while and so she had some really quite quite nice um, textiles and lots of things from the 50s yes, and so okay. I ended up making a beautiful patchwork cushion um I said this domestic science teacher would be <laughs> staggered probably to find that I'm now spending most of my yes. time um, creating through Lovely. stitching um, because she certainly didn't think I had a future. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a parent, parent you know, m- mother, mother's influence, yes. um, lots of dressmaking. Um, when I was a teenager, we lived in Paris for a while, or near Paris, mm-hmm. and I used to spend my clothing allowance each month going up to the Marché Saint-Pierre below Sacré-Cœur where right. they had a wonderful five-story oh. building warehouse just full of fabrics. Um, so deciding what I was going to make that month or every couple of months, depending on how much money I needed yes. for it, um, I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and then once I went to university, I, I started really doing more patchwork and quilting um, and made my first full-size bed quilt at that point because, yes. um, you know, you always have a lot of spare time at university. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it's lovely. I still have it. It's, it's, it's on our, one of our guest beds now. Oh, how nice. um, and then sort of later had children, clothed them, so again, knitted and sewed, um, kept up with the patchwork and quilting and finally did City and Guilds about 20 years ago in Scunthorpe. Right. Um, where I met uh, Pauline Haywood, yes. our regional yes. chair yes, for the Embroidery right, yes. Guild, because she, yes. she taught me. She, she ah. taught me um, preparing working designs, um, as it was a separate part of the course at that time. Right, yes. Um, so I did my first design work with her and did the patchwork and quilting with Jan Dowson, who was right. teaching over there then. Um, and then really... I mean, made quilts, decided that bed quilts, you, can, you only need so many of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so moved on to more sort of art quilts, really, and created massive hanging, which is in our hallway now, um, based on uh, medieval tiles. Right, yes. Um, where I made them all out of felt and um, all sorts of different fabrics uh-huh. um, and made comp- composite uh, piece um, and then went and taught for years and years which stopped me you know I had 10, <laughs> 10 years in school which stopped me really making anything for myself other than the odd bit of knitting um, because you, I just didn't have the headspace to design. Oh that's um, right I think when your head's crammed of lots of other things it is really hard to try and switch the creativity on and you're just kind of too tired aren't you really you think oh I just can't think really what to do next exactly. so yeah it's, exactly so and I did, I did I did an art and textiles club with the with the children yes um and we did all sorts of batik and interesting things and I enjoyed doing stitching with with, with my class but I didn't do anything really for me then yes, and it was yes. only after finishing teaching I decided to get out while I was still alive yeah it's almost a <laughs> weekly story is this it's 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 sad in a way. Um, it's like so many other artists who I've spoken to say the same kind of thing. You know, the, so many people have been teachers and then are also glad to escape and kind of crack on with the, uh, the textile work and things. So, yeah, it's a, a very, very common yeah, so story, it, is that? It takes a long time to recover from mm. from, from getting out of teaching yes, as well. Yes. And then we had our, our three-month sabbatical in Palestine, which um, I, I took so many photos and had loads of ideas of things that I wanted to make, but came back and immediately had to go into surgery and chemo <sighs> and radiotherapy oh. for a breast cancer. <sighs> and it was only at the end of that, really, so the middle of 2014, that I went along to... Um, the, the Fransco Centre, which I think no longer exists in Cleethorpes, where they were running City and Guilds courses and where Jan Dowson, my teacher from 15, 16 years before, was still tutoring. Oh, right, and brilliant. I saw their end of year show and I just thought, oh, this is what I need to do again. I need to go on a course and get myself kick-started so that all this material and inspiration in my head yeah. can actually find a way out. Um, so I enrolled on Creative Textiles and... Um, really discovered that I loved 
embroidery, loved hand embroidery, uh, which isn't something that, that I'd done very much before. Right. So, so with all was... your all your creativity, embroidery hadn't really kind of had much of a look in then, really. But no, it was a sort of an extra add-on. I'd done yes. little bits, yes. but, but I hadn't done anything. You know, I certainly wouldn't have called myself an embroiderer, whereas I do now. Yes. Um, and so, you know, through Jan and her enthusiasm for hand stitching, um, but also just through all the interesting techniques and different things we were doing on the course, I just thought, wow, mm. this is actually what I want to spend my time doing. Right. So <laughs> uh, fabulous, and and, and say an, an excellent an excellent discovery there for uh, just a, you know relatively couple of years ago. So uh, and yes, re- really new. Yes, yes, I've only been doing it really for the, for three years. Yep. Yeah, what a wonderful story. That's brilliant, Deborah. <laughs> I think what's particularly nice as well is that you, you've come full, full circle in meeting old friends too, like Pauline and Jan, and they're kind of back in the story again. So I think that's that's a lovely thing as well to to have that thread there of, of common friendship as well. Yes, no, it's been lovely, lovely re- reconnecting with them. Yeah. So from that uh, interest, kind of setting on fire, as it were, who or what? Have therefore been your major inspirations. I've got you know, over the years, but really in terms of your embroidery and creativity, and currently, Deborah. Right. I think. I mean, going back years, I've always loved colour. Mm. Um, so even when I was knitting, K. Facet. Yes, yes. His, his, his early knitted things. I used to do quite a lot of those. I mean, using my own colours and ideas, but but taking some of his designs. Yes. Um, some lovely things in quilts. Deirdre Amsden years ago was doing fantastic colour shaded quilts with all sorts of different printed fabrics which I enjoyed and just that playing with colour and watching one colour merge into another Mm. um so that that you know as as an early inspiration really and has has remained with me though I'm not working in those fields um and then I think since being in Palestine getting involved with people and with issues and also seeing such beautiful places um I think the major inspiration for everything I'm doing at the moment, um, bar one or two little tiny sidelines, um, has has been Palestinian um, both places, but also the costume and the embroidery um, in Bethlehem, where there's a very rich tradition of couching, um, maybe inspired by ecclesiastical or even Ottoman um, oh, officials. Right. Uh-huh. Um, but the chest pieces of special dresses in Bethlehem that were the Paris fashions yes, of their time, yes. sort of um, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, wonderful designs using gold couched thread and then with other silk threads to build up designs, quite quite symmetrical, um, but very rich, very rich in colour, in texture, very densely stitched. Um, so I've been doing a, a body of work based on that, right? Yes. and also just just the political situation has inspired me to to look at issues of memory and longing and a symbol that I've encountered at the entrance to a refugee camp in Bethlehem it was called the Key of Return oh, right. for this immense um, several ton yeah. metal key um, stands above the entrance arch in, into the Ida camp in Bethlehem, and that struck me at the time and it's a very very potent image yes that lots of families who were um had to leave their homes in 1948 as the state of israel was was founded right, and yes. people were moved palestinians were moved out of their villages and sometimes their villages destroyed many of those people still still have their descendants still have the key to their family home mm. and it's a, a really strong symbol of the wanting to return i mean many of those homes don't exist any longer yes, or yes. if they do are certainly occupied by other people mm. um but 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 owning the key and having the keeping the key safe is a very very important part of, of 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 their history and their story and so one of the things i did for my sitting guilds is 3d work oh, i yes. wanted to do something based on on the key yes. and i tried all sorts of playing mm. around with ideas and in the end decided i'm going to make a large key so about four and a half foot long oh. um <laughs> constructed out of um, old cardboard boxes, you know, thick cardboard yes, boxes, yes. and lemonade bottles. All right, yes. Um, I say, you know, you can take the teacher out of the yes. primary school, but you probably can't <laughs> take the primary school out of the teacher. Um, so good old Blue Peter style exactly. and, and primary school construction. 
Um, and then I dyed fabric and I've printed and stenciled and embroidered and appliqued and it's turned into this beautiful piece that has the names of the 520 plus villages that were ethnically cleansed at that time. Right. So it's my tribute, my yes. my memory piece, really, for, 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 for that period and, you know, inspired by this wonderful large key, which was taken off to Berlin to the Biennale about oh. five years ago. Yes. Take a low loader and across the sea, ah. and I watched the video of this and thought, well, if they can move that around, I'm sure I can make a smaller version. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that sounds absolutely wonderful, and it's it's quite funny you talking about keys this week. Um, last week I was on a, a guest of somebody else's podcast, and one of the questions they asked was, "What was my earliest childhood memory?" and and I kind of dug around, and then I remembered about when I was at primary school, and I'd only been there a couple of weeks. Me and my friend made a paper key to um, escape out of school, nip round the corner to her house, <laughs> open the locked door with this paper key and get her, I think it was a nurse's dressing up outfit that we desperately needed for some particular reason that we thought. And um, yeah, and of course we got we got caught as we were getting to the school gate. Oh, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell, shout somebody. So, but um, I, I was, I'd, and I'd kind of forgotten about that. But then, yeah, to bring back this memory, this paper key, and I was like howling with laughter with my friends saying, what, what did we think? And we're still friends now. What? What were we thinking of at age five, you know, that this paper key would work? So so you've got a cardboard one made out of plastic and things, and I've got a paper Yes, one, so. yes, plastic <laughs> bottles and, and, and cardboard. Um, <laughs> and once it's covered up, of course, you'd never know that that's what's inside. No, absolutely. No, it sounds beautiful. Part of the sun is looking and knowing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I can see how that's been a, a, a major inspiration as your your trip. And as you say, the two aspects of it as well, not just the kind of embroidery of the area, but the situation there. And as, as you say, like 500, 512, did you say, villages? But, yeah, 520, wow. just over 520, yeah. Yes, that is like, that's a lot of people moved around as well, isn't it? So and, yes. and it's a story as well, I think, that almost kind of rambles on in the background and you know people don't necessarily know what happened and why and what's going on now and why and so I think to be able to bring some of that in to your work as well is is a really interesting way of kind of marking marking events and marking thoughts so yeah good one and it's lovely because it gives me a chance to do some very contrasting work i mean yes. some of it is, is is beautiful and vibrant and colorful use, using the, the the bethlehem couching the, the, the mm. embroidery designs and some of it is is quite muted and subtle and I'm, i've been doing work using old keys and mm. wrapping them in stitched linen oh, and right. allowing the, the rust yes. to transfer onto the fabric yes um and then sometimes taking the stitching out and using the threads that have also been partly rusted by the keys ah, to make right, yes. further pieces, yes. which is like stages of memory and how you mm. know memories are passed on to one generation and then to the next. Yes. So they become further and further away from the original. Right. Yes. Yes. You know, ah. they're, 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 trans, they're, they're, they're passed on, mm. but they change. They, yes. they transmute as well. Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely fascinating. So um, now, uh, just before I forget, you are doing an expi- uh, ex- I, don't, I keep saying expedition, exhibition. <laughs> you are doing an exhibition next year, isn't it? So will we be able to see some of this work then? Yes, the the, the bulk of it, I think all of it, yes. will, will, will be in the exhibition because Fabulous. I wanted to exhibit next year because yes. it is the fifth, the. Um, 70 years. 70, yes, so we can say 70. I was just doing a bit of maths in my head there. You said 1940. Yeah, and I thought, yeah that's uh, 70 but, years. Yeah. So, so through through to 2018, and mm. so I really wanted to to have a body of work ready to exhibit in in that year, um, marking the anniversary. There's obviously been a lot of anniversaries over over, over yes. these last couple of years, um, and so I've been able to 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 find a venue, and hopefully, uh, all all of this different work, I'd say some of it beautiful and challenge and and, and colourful, and others oh, yes. a bit bit more 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 challenging, and the thought provoking yes um, but all together sort of builds up a story and it's really my response yes so it's 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 not giving anything other really than, than my no, response, than response to, to, to it, palestine yeah. and to the situation there no that sounds absolutely fascinating and um I, I, hopefully i might be able to get over and and have a look now oh i hope so yes definitely now moving on to techniques you've mentioned the couching um, you know what? What are your favourite techniques, Deborah, and 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 why do you like them so much? I think within the hand stitching, I've I've 
just fallen in love with couching. Mm. I love the idea that you can, it, you can, it gives you line, but it also, you can use it as filling yes. as well. And so, so you can build up a really int- intricate patterning as well as following, following line. Mm. And just the feel, I'm doing a lot of work now based on handmade felt. Right. So I've taken some of these traditional designs, um, but I've decided to free them up. I ah, call them open yes. Bethlehem. Ah. So, <laughs> freeing up the design, but also hopefully, you know, one day freeing, yes. up, freeing up Bethlehem from occupation. But so working on handmade felt with different coloured borders, so that none of them are square. Right. Um, you know, if you make handmade felt, it comes out mm-hmm. as it, it wants does, to come yes. out. Um, <laughs> Which of course gives a lovely flow. So I'm 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 bordering. I'm 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 echoing the the, the 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 borders, but I'm also then creating the designs using couching primarily, but decided to to incorporate wire ah. rather than the the gold thread. Yes. So just trying to take in a slightly different way. So, but just handling, especially felt, mm. um, is just such a lovely. Thing to work into and the, the, the wire and the thread just sink into it because I don't felt it completely. Right. So, so the tactile yeah. qualities of that, I think, explain why yes. I, I enjoy that so much. Yes. Um, I enjoy working on calico. I dye my fabrics and many of my threads and, you know, I, I'm quite happy to work on, on calico, which is the other material I usually use. Mm. But the, the, the felt in particular at the moment is, is really grabbing me. But I like, I mean, I like um, printing as well. So, so I enjoy creating lino prints and then using them onto calico in that case, and then right, stitching yes. into those, um, which have produced some, some 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 nice effects. And I still enjoy applique. You know, going back to my patchwork and quilting yes. um, roots, as it were, <laughs> um, and so, some some machine applique. Um, the same place where I've took the inspiration, the Hamama Lane lying on the floor taking pictures of these, these domes and light coming through. I also have a lovely piece that I've made which is looking through doors or through entrance arches into rooms and then further into oh, rooms right, so yes. it goes further and further away, uh, which is all machine applique. So yeah, I'm trying not to be a one-trick pony. Yes. <laughs> um, and really, you know, whatever seems to be the appropriate to technique for, for what I'm trying to do but I, I do come back each time to, to some hand stitching. Yes well it's it's just nice isn't it to be able to kind of sit there and, and, and get it out as you say and the some of the hand dyed threads and the, the felt and the fabrics are just they do just feel lovely don't they they're really just nice yeah. just yeah you know, sometimes and I get I think you can curl up in an armchair yeah. to do that you, you know can. you can actually you don't have to sit on a, at a table at a machine yes. um, you, you, you can you can sit wherever you like or out in the garden um, so all, all, all the pleasures at once. Uh, absolutely Absolutely. So what would you say, Deborah, has been the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far? What have you got to share with us for that? Um, well, I've got a couple of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was very exciting this summer. Um, we moved house on the 6th of June and I had been invited to, down to London for uh-huh. the 8th of June. Right. Uh, having... <laughs> So we thought, okay, unpacking can wait because yes. the invitation was to St James's Palace um, to be given an award by Princess Anne. Oh, how fantastic! Um, <laughs> have, so definitely a highlight for this year. Yes. Um, having done the City and Guilds uh, Creative Textiles, I was nominated for a gold medal. Um, oh, right. By the, the City and Guilds. Yes. And so we had to put together a great package of my work and what I was doing and sent that off. And it's an honour enough, really, to be to be nominated. Yes. But I won it wow. for the Creative Textiles course. Oh, so wow. that was another trip to London um, to, 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 be, to, to join with the other Medals for Excellence winners. Yes. But having, having been told that I was that I got this, I then had another phone call from someone who said, oh, you know, we'd like to give you another award. Oh. And apparently the livery companies in London, the yes. city and guilds, yes. so that the guilds, um, choose some of the, the people in their sort of relevant courses who have, have been given the gold medal. Yes. And they don't do it every year, so yeah. it's up to them. They don't have to choose someone. Oh, right, but if, yes. if they see something that really sort of sparks catches their imagination them, yes. or ca- catches their interest... Um, and so the Worshipful Company of Haberdashers had decided that they'd like to give me their award this year. Oh, wow. And this was going to be presented at St. James Palace yes. on, on the 8th of June, which, um, if, you know, in case you've forgotten, was also the, end, the, the day of the general election. So oh, there was a lot crikey, to yes, it was, that, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, tra- we travelled down to London and, and had a lovely day at mm. St. James Palace. Wow. Um, Princess Anne was in, very impressive 
she had no notes. Yes. She remembered an immense amount of detail about each person to whom she was giving an award and was oh, able to right. have a, a short chat with yes. each of us um, well, that's nice, it, during the actual yes. presentation. Lovely. And then afterwards, while we're having afternoon tea, we're sort of grouped with our sponsors from yes. this, the um, haberdashers uh-huh. or the, whichever livery company. And then she came round each table to have a chat with us again. Right. So, oh. you know, that, that really was quite a, quite a special Special, special day. Yes. I've been twice before for my son's getting getting um, Duke of Edinburgh awards. Right, yes, yes. So we've worked our way through the Duke of yes. Edinburgh <laughs> and the Earl of Wessex and now the Princess Royal. Oh, you are doing well then, aren't you? <laughs> well, all the more special for having it in my own right rather than going as, a, as an invited guest of a child. Yes, yes. Oh, <laughs> um, wonderful. So, so that, that was one major highlight. Yes. Um, and then the second one was, was a little different. Um, because I've been researching all this, the Palestinian costume, mm-hmm. um, one of the main writers in, in, in Britain is a lady called Sheila Weir, who has written for the British Museum. And so she's she's done lovely books about their collection. And years and years ago, before it was one my interest, there was a Museum of Mankind exhibition of mm-hmm. Palestinian costume. And so I thought, well, I know they've got an awful lot of costume in store from the British Museum because yes. none of it's on show at the moment. Mm-hmm. So I got in touch with them and said, would it be possible to see some of the items? Because I've seen them in books and in photographs, yes. but, but not in the flesh, as it yes, were. Yes, yes. And so they have a wonderful system. They have their, their store is at, is at Olympia. And I was able to choose 10 items. And I went there and they had these 10 items out on the table and um, dresses and jackets and other bits of, of embroidery. Oh. And I was allowed to handle them, to measure them, to oh, turn things lovely. inside out, to see how they're constructed uh, and just get a real feel for, you know, 19th, late 19th century, early, early 20th yes. century um, Palestinian dresses. I've seen uh-huh. some while we're in Palestine on on models, you know, behind yes. glass cases. Yes. But to actually be able to handle and to feel the fabrics and I say, to, to look at construction and to see how fine some of the work was. Because in photographs, they're, to be able to see clearly, they're blown up, yes, um, and you know, enlarged. And so I was working from that. But actually, some of the borders with quite intricate detail were about seven millimetres wide. Oh, crikey, yes. Uh, so you get a much better idea <laughs> of scale, don't you, with all, with all of that, seeing it in real life. Yeah, so that, yeah. Re- that, that, that really enthused mm. me. And it's, it's been able, because I give talks now on, on, on Palestinian costume and Bethlehem embroidery in yes. particular. Um, but actually to be able to show some of my own pictures as well as, as pictures from the British Museum, which, which one can use if it's yes. not for gain. Yes, yes. Um, and, and to be able to say to people, you know, look at this, look at the detail. And now, you know, picture less than a centimetre wide for this particular border. Yes. And you get this intake of breath of, mm. wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it looks much chunkier in the photo than it is in real life. In real life, yes. Now, uh, my first guest, Alison Larkin, she has a thing for... Uh, 17th century or is it 18th I don't she'll kill me now but um, early waistcoats embroidered waistcoats and she did a replica of Captain Cook's um, waistcoat that his wife he never actually got to wear it because he was killed beforehand but she right. went over to the Maritime Museum in Sydney or a couple of the museums in Sydney where they had some earlier Captain Cook waistcoats and you know embroidered ones and, and she said the same it was wonderful to be able to Measurement because she was interested in the, the construction and you know the, just the general styling and, and everything. She mm. said it was just wonderful to be able to be there, look at it, take your own photos, your own measurements, and again look at the you know the construction and, and all the rest of it. So it just makes it it brings it to life, doesn't it? Yes, and and you know if you're researching into an into an area to yes. to, to handle the actual artifact thing, yes, is is really important. It yeah. is. So, well, those are two absolutely wonderful highlights. Very contrasting, but very interesting for us as well. So, <laughs> thank you for bringing that to us. <laughs> now then, so you've said you've been back at your embroidery for you know a relatively short period of time, but you were doing your patchwork and so forth. So do you have any of those dreaded UFOs lurking around in the back of a cupboard somewhere? And do you think you'll ever finish it? And um, how long has it been on the go? <laughs> um, yeah. 
funnily enough, I I did have a UFO. Oh, did have. Yes. Did have. Maybe, <laughs> but actually, actually, this has got completed. Um, before I started Patchwork and Quilting City and Guilds in about 1998, 1999, I had started making a, another patchwork quilt over papers. Mm. And it had little nine patch blocks and I took it away quilt, um, when I went camping on holiday. Yes, you know, took it, it in a nice cream me. box yes. and just get it out in an evening when you weren't doing very much. But once I started the course, I didn't really have time to do it because mm. I was busy designing my own things and learning yes. lots of new techniques. So these bits, I mean, I must have got to the point of, of actually constructing the top of the quilt. I, th- I think I'd put it together mm. before I started the course um, and had maybe started quilting a corner or two, but hadn't, hadn't got far. And it was a double bed quilt. Yes. And so two years ago, just really towards the end of, of my latest City and Guild, yes. um, I thought... Okay, this is not going to remain unfinished. I, yes. I really don't like having yes. things around, and I've, it's it's been kept very safely all together with its fabrics. You know, and yeah. it, it was all there. Good. I thought I'm going to get this finished. Yay. So, less than two years ago, I finally <laughs> qu- quilted and finished quilting and bound the edges of of, of this this large piece. In the meantime, of course, bed sizes have changed. Yeah. When I first started making it, I had a double bed. Yes. And since then, graduated to a king size. Yeah. So I'm afraid it doesn't grace a bed, but it does look very nice over the couch in my workroom. Um, oh, and I enjoy really. seeing it. Yes. Because it reminds me that, oh, it, I, I mean, I enjoyed making it. I mm. couldn't make it again. Yes. Um, but you know, the idea of it sitting there, what a waste of all the time yes. that I'd already put into it if I didn't get it finished. I've got a couple of other bits that are the workshops I've been on that, you know, oh, they're a classic, aren't they? <laughs> yes. Um, but, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get there, I hope. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I like that. The uh, the UFO that is now finished. Excellent. I have to say, um, when, when I was living in France and I, there was no like embroidery group or anything I'd be part of, and I did go through and finish off quite a few things that had been languishing, you know, when I had a, a, full, a full-time, very busy career and was never really at home. So I did actually go through and, and, and made a real special effort that I am not starting anything else. I am going to finish off <laughs> what I've already done. And I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed finishing those things off and I felt so chuffed with myself that, yes, I've done that. Now I'm free now. And then I felt free, free to yeah. go and do something else, you know, and that was, it is, it was just, I was really pleased I did it. So, yeah. <laughs> I found quite a good way, actually, of finishing off things. Um, it's, it's to sit up all night watching <laughs> the results of the American election or the results of the Brexit um, <laughs> referendum. Things, yes. I mean, I don't recommend either of the results, um, <laughs> spot, spot my, my political proclivities. Um, but I did, I, again, I'd been on workshops and I had a couple of pieces. And so each, for each of those events, I got one of those pieces out and I stitched while I watched because I thought that way I'll keep my eyes open. <laughs> it's, you know, when you're sitting there till four in the morning, finally thinking, OK, I do know what this result is going to be. I am going to have oh, to, go to, to, bed. Go to go to bed. Now. But yes. I, I, I finished two pieces by doing that. Oh, well, very good. So, and the temptation is that, there. That's my recommended right? technique. Yeah, well, a, a temptation, of course, is you've got your needle there and you can just keep stabbing something with your needle, can't you? And you're not very happy about what's happening. You know, and Quite give cathartic. It, yeah. Give it another stab. <laughs> Washing the tears out afterwards, though. <laughs> Have you ever heard of the saying, beware of long distant elephants? So it's those items that seem so very far away, but they slowly creep up on you. Suddenly they're looming large. So how do you manage your distant elephants? How do you keep track of your creative projects and your time? Keep self-organised, but keep that creative juice flowing. What are your tips for success there? Um, I think anyone who knows me well knows I'm one for planning ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was a teacher, I was, yes, I was very good power, at forward yes. planning <laughs> and, you know, making sure that everything's there and dotting I's and crossing T's. So really, I suppose that characteristic carries over right, into my work, yes, yes. Um, you know, whether it's planning a house move or yes. um, preparing for an exhibition. Um, you know, I'm just getting well ahead. If, you, if I know I've got a deadline, yes. then I try and get as many things as can be done ahead done mm. because then they don't you know come up and bite you in that yes. last week when yes, suddenly yes. there are other panics Thing, yes other um, things happen don't they and you get <laughs> yeah yeah well like life life tends to just happen at you yes, doesn't it, it does. um <laughs> so you know i've been preparing posters and starting work on on advertising and this sort of thing um just because that's that's me really mm-hmm. um and so 
and I'm because I'm I'm leading a workshop on the technique with the felt and wire that I've been yes, doing. Yes. Again, making sure that that's prepared well in advance, that all the samples are done, that all the packs are put together. So really, my tip is just be terribly organised well ahead. Yes. And yes. I say, and anyone that knows me will yes. just be grinning yeah. at the moment because um, they, yep, yep, we could have written that for yes. her. <laughs> Brilliant. And there'll still be things that loom up. You know, oh, yes. I, I, I appreciate that. But at least all the things that I can organise will be out the way. Yes, no, I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that. I'm I'm exactly the same. If I can get something organised in advance, then I, I do. Uh, and then you do know that other things are going to come along at some point. And, but then you can manage the level of chaos, can't you, really, when what you've done, you've done as much as you can, and then you're not left yeah. with a pile of things. So, yeah, that's um, I, I'm, I'm very much like that as well. Well, so, and, and, <laughs> and yes, it's a week before Christmas, yeah. and my presents are wrapped. <laughs> 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 ah well, I I, did, I I scored a good one with that because I was uh, I took my son over to my mum's on um, on Friday and I was going out for for the evening so he was staying there and I had intentions to have all these presents wrapped to kind of give so that she could distribute them to my brothers and nieces and all the rest of it. Yeah. Anyway, I just ran out of time on the Friday. I got some client work that I needed to finish off, so the wrapping of presents got waylaid. And then I suddenly thought I've got no chance now of getting this done. So I I, I rang her up and I said. Well, I am just going to bring them and dump them. But do you think you and Ryan could possibly have a lovely hour <laughs> this evening wrapping presents for me? So, oh, very clever. So, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. Well, I hadn't intended doing that, but that's what happened. So um, it was more important that they got there so then they could, you know, go to where they were going rather than sat here late and wrapped. There yes. was, was going to be no use. So, yeah, so that was quite handy. I got my son and my mum to do it for me. So there we are. <laughs> So talking about future plans, and you've mentioned about your exhibition already, sort of you know, what plans and other projects would you like to share with us um, today that you've got organised for next year and, and beyond, Deborah? Well, our, our most imminent thing is that we're actually going to manage another trip back to, to Palestine. Oh, so we've, we've planned a trip to Bethlehem yes. in February. Um, and one of the things I'm wanting to do, just trying to get organized at the moment while I'm there, is to meet up with the people from the Women's Child Care Society who have a group that still do the traditional Bethlehem couching. Right. Um, they make items for tourists now, maybe yes. table runners and cushions and uh -huh. such like. But there is a group of, of women who, are being tr who have been trained in the technique, and apparently it takes about six months oh. um, to train. Yes. Now, I've sort of taught myself. Taught yourself, really. so that'll um, be interesting, but, won't it? <laughs> well, I just, I really want to meet with them, yes. sort of learn from some of their expertise. I'm sure I will learn some things that I haven't occurred. Oh my goodness, that would be so much better Easier. way of doing yes, it. Yes, yes. Um, but also to be able to take some of some pictures of what I've been doing and show them how their work has inspired other work. Other work as well. Um, that'll be nice. So, that'll be lovely for them to see that as well, won't it? Then? Well, yeah. I, ho I hope interesting. so. Yes, and, and sure also there's a, a new museum since we went there, yes. um, which has quite a lot of costume in. So I'm hoping to get there. I've seen a few things online, but I actually want to go and visit there. So, so we've got a trip to Palestine, which will really re not that I need re yeah. but it, it, it'll put another burst yes. of, of, of enthusiasm in. Yes. Um, and then when I come back, it'll be, it'll be getting all the last pieces um, finished off mm -hmm. because my exhibition's in June, June the 6th, yes. the 10th, yes. um, in this old school room in Howarth, which oh, was right. where Charlotte Bronte yes. used to teach. Oh, um, nice and close to home, so that yes. I can I can help help steward that. Lovely. Um, so, I think those 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 are probably the main things. And I've got some other. So once I've finished with the Palestinian work, mm. which I hope you know by the time of the exhibition, I will have worked out all, all the yes. things I wanted to to, to put down. Um, I've I've then got you know one or two other things that I want to be working on. I saw a beautiful silk bag from the Mamluk period, which is somewhere between the 12th and 1500s. Right. Um, well, I was in the Ashmol Ashmolean uh -huh. Museum um, the other week. Yes. And it's. Egyptian and silk Ooh. and tiny sort of one inch squares with lots of little little um, pierced holes and then outlined in um, buttonhole stitch making right. patterns. Yes. And again, it's pretty fine. So yes. I'm not quite sure. I, I bought some silk and some silks to try and to try that out. But I'd like to, to do some some work based on that. Yes. Sort of take myself off in a slightly different direction uh -huh. while sticking with Middle Eastern textiles. Yes. Yes. Um, 
and and my, and my mother lives near an, an, an alley called Snatch Up Alley, <laughs> uh, which is just a great evocative name, isn't it? You it's imagine Cuthbert, yeah, isn't? absolutely. Whatever. Whereabouts um, is that? I walk down. In, in St Albans, right. I walk down there every time to go into town from her house. Yeah. And I took lots of photographs when I was there a couple of years ago when she wasn't very well. Mm. And I've got uh, all the plants and the, I don't know, the, 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 the fences, the grills in the floor, all sorts of yeah. man-made texture, but also also plant life. Yes. But, so loads and loads and loads of different different plants and wildflowers and weeds and yeah. all sorts of things down the laburnum trees. Um, and so I've, I've got a, a series in mind yes. using those sort of pictures and textures, which I'm not quite sure I'm going to do with yet. But once I say time frees up yeah. after June, then then that's that's on my list. Ooh, well, that sounds a really nice project as well, is it? Based based on a, a, something with such an interesting name as well. So yes, yes. Well, it's, it's quite fun, isn't it? it and, is. and we'll get, and we'll take me in a different direction. Yes, which is, yes. It's good. Well, I think create create create. Creative, creatively, what have I said? Uh, yes, I think creatively, it's nice to be able to go in different directions as well, isn't it? And kind of stretch your brain and get you thinking about different things in a different way as well. So, lovely. yeah, it makes you use new techniques and not it just does. stick with what, you, what yes. you're most comfortable with. Yes. So, you know, I'm quite happy to, 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 to stick with that, but it's good to have some branches out in different directions as well. Brilliant. Well, that all sounds extremely interesting and another trip as well and your exhibition. And um, yes, yeah, good good plans for the future. So uh, kind of wrapping up, thank you so much, Deborah, for sharing your very interesting stitchery story with us today. It has been fascinating finding more about you and your art and particularly your inspiration from your, your visit as well. Um, we've mentioned um, already your website, Deborah Mullins. Dot uk and some of the images that you've shared with me will be on your Stitchery Stories episode as well for people to have a look at. Thank you so much, Deborah. It's been absolutely fascinating. Oh, thank you. It's I've really enjoyed sharing some of it with you. Brilliant. Thank you. If you like this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories. 